Hello, hello, 13 jurors. Oh my gosh, I feel like I have not seen y'all in forever. It has been so, so long. It has been the craziest, <laughs> craziest week and a half ever. And I have been working on a million different things and y'all have been out there hunting fugitives and it's just been a wild couple of weeks and I, well, like week and a half, I guess, but I have, I guess only technically been a week because of Labor Day, but regardless, it feels like forever since I've been able to be on stream and hang out and, um, and it's, it's been a while. Um, I am glad to be back. Lucy, you can't tell it from, uh, her full belly. And I don't know why she passed out on her rug instead of on her, um, on her bed. Uh, I think she's just like too full to like actually, you know, um, climb over. She's like full and fat and got three treats. I've been in, I had to go, I thought it was Tallahassee, but thank God I checked before I went, but I've been in Pensacola, um, all morning for a doctor's appointment. So, uh, and it's like a, a little over two hour drive. So I had to go there and then come back. And so I've been gone all morning. So when I got home, she got extra treats and extra love. And so now she's like fat and happy and just passed out down there like a little pot belly pig. So, um, so I am excited to see y'all. I, uh, I hope that, um, if you haven't had a chance to, uh, listen to the podcast, um, then, that's kind of what we're going to go over today is everything that's in episode one. I have been, I've spent the last week, like the last few weeks researching this. And, um, and every time I thought I had a full grasp on, um, you know, all of the details involved, then I would pull another court document and start digging and there would be more stuff happening. And then y'all know how I like to, you know, stalk people and stuff like that. So then I would, you know, start doing some digging and then find more things. And then I just, it, it has been, it has been when I picked this one as the case that I wanted to do the podcast on, um, cause I had another one picked, but I've been talking to, um, the, uh, guy, I, he, it, he is in jail for murdering my friend and, um, and, uh, and seven of her family members. So he's, uh, he's charged with, uh, eight murders total. And one of them is, is my friend. And it's actually his, um, like he's a cousin. Anyway, um, I believe he's innocent. And I was going to do that trial, but now they're, they're about to do an appeal. So his attorney asked for me to wait. So I've been looking for something and I was like, I want something that is just as, um, controversial, just as, you know, where there's two totally different sides. And I want to, you know, dig and find out the truth and see what we can, you know, find out because you can't just listen to one, one side or the other. You need to hear everything before you can make a decision. So I wanted something that I felt passionate about like that. And then along came justice for John O'Keefe. Now there are two very split sides to, to, the, to this case. And both feel incredibly passionate about their own side. I have my own thoughts on it. And, um, I am going to try to keep my thoughts out of it as much as possible so that I can make sure that I present both sides because there are things on both sides that don't necessarily make sense. But that's how real life is. R real life is not a movie. There's always going to be things that, you know, you you don't know how it works or why it works. But, you know, things that happen that, um, you know, you don't know the explanation for. That's just how it is. So there are things to be questioned on both sides. But when you put out the evidence and look at everything, I feel like that's where the devil's in the details. And that's what I really want this whole thing to be about. So um, I worked 
so hard, <laughs> so hard on this. And the um, the first episode uh, was probably one of the hard. I, it was the it was the most work I've done on any of my projects since uh, the original like Murdoch charts. I think because, like as far as time goes, um, I mean, I haven't slept in three weeks, if that tells you <laughs> anything, but the, um, the totality of how much is involved in this and it's so messy and there's so many connections and there's so many inconsistencies and there's so much to this case. And, you know, y'all know how I am. My number one thing is like, you know, facts and victims, I guess that's two things, but like, I want nothing but like, you know, truth and facts. And if we have theories and stuff like that, that's awesome. But I, I want to specify that, um, you know, that there are fact, facts and theories. And I want to take a look at what we know for a fact. And then like, keep out the conspiracy stuff as far as um, I don't want to present anything that's not fact as, as fact. Does that make sense? Y'all know how I like to do. So if there's anything that is a conspiracy that is not proven, I very clearly specify this is the, a theory, not a fact. I want to present the facts so that we can all make our own decisions because that's, you know, that's all we can do. So, um, I just want to be really clear about that. And there, there are two heated sides to this. The people who are on the prosecution side, you know, like some of the stuff, and I've watched some of the interviews and stuff like that, different podcasts and appearances and read different like tweets and, you know, things like that, articles. I mean, they're, you know, they're saying things like how it's, you know, nonsense and it's, uh, you know, it's so stupid. And uh, Wendy Murphy even compared it to a uh, Saturday Night Live skit and said, um, you know, stuff about how uh, the cell phone expert, you know, sold his soul to the devil for cash or something like that. That's not the exact quote. The exact quote is in the um, in the uh, podcast, whatever it was. I don't have it in front of me, but something like that. So. It's crazy. Um, but let me show you. Um, thank you, Ashley. Oh, I didn't turn on my sound thing before I turned my computer on. Oh, I don't have my sounds on. Thank you so much, Ashley Snow. I wish I'd have remembered that before I did this, and I I didn't. Um, thank you so much. I appreciate the the super chat, super sticker. Uh, uh, let's see. I want to show y'all. I have missed y'all, too. I see y'all. I see y'all. I've missed y'all too. Um, I want to show y'all. This is the um, oh, Lucy's Lucy's disappearing. Uh, oops. This is just like a little trail. But we begin with a developing story. Boston Police this will show Officer you. John O'Keefe. John O'Keefe. John O'Keefe. Was found face up in the snow on Saturday morning. Outside a home currently occupied by people known to O'Keefe. Officer Seraf uh, observed the victim to be cold to the touch. Uh, no signs of breath. He was transported to the Good Samaritan Medical Center where he was pronounced dead. State prosecutors accuse Karen Reed, who was O'Keefe's girlfriend, of backing into him and leaving him to die in the snow. Reed and the victim had been out drinking at a couple of bars in town the night before when they were later invited back to a home on Fairview Road. She stated that she dropped the victim off and left. Reed's attorney says she tried to call O'Keefe and had no idea anything had happened to him. Reed pleaded not guilty to manslaughter, motor vehicle homicide, and leaving the scene of a crash causing death. An investigation into the death of a Boston police officer in Canton has taken a turn. Lawyers for the woman under arrest not only say their client is innocent, they're alleging a cover-up. Prosecutors point to pieces of a broken taillight as evidence, but her lawyers argue the police report was altered. First got to that scene at 6 a.m. and did not find a single piece of taillight and then 12 hours later, boom, they found taillight everywhere. People in this town are scared 
of the people who are supposed to protect and serve. I don't think there's, there's any kind of conspiracy or anything like that. They say there were a lot of people at the home that night, and one of them Googled how long to die in the cold hours before Reed would have known O'Keefe was missing. Reed, God, Reed. Reed, God, Reed. This is not a Hollywood star. This is an accused murderer getting a standing ovation as she enters the courtroom. What is going on out there? Okay, so that's the little, um, like, kind of intro that I did. Um, now, I want to say, I... Um, I feel like I'm like asking for trouble having, um, you know, bringing this one on. I know that this is very, people are very passionate about their sides, but I do want to say that whoever wants to come in and, and talk and discuss and, you know, listen and give feedback and give, you know, any of that, everybody's totally welcome. But the thing is, I want to, um, I want to all be respectful. This is not the type of chat where we're going to be mean to each other or, um, anything like that. Like this is, you know, anybody here is allowed to disagree, but we are not going to be like Wendy Murphy where we're like, you know, laughing at people and telling them they're stupid and um, stuff like that. Like that's not, that's, that's not what this is. So, um, so uh, any, anybody in here that wants to hang out and talk and go over everything cool, but I want to make sure that um, everybody keeps it respectful and none of us act like act like like that mess that was on there um all right so i want to show you some pictures and kind of give you an idea of who's who first thing i want to pull up let me show you um because y'all this is um <laughs> there's a lot there's a lot of people involved in this so let me show you um where did i save that i have too many too many files. Alrighty. All right. So this, um, let me make myself smaller so we don't miss anything. Okay, so this is our who's who. And this is going, and I tried to keep this as simple as I can for the intro episode. But this is not even all of the players involved in this. This expands and gets even messier. So if you think looking at this is, is a lot, this is just for the introduction. There is another, there's another sister who's, you know, and there's, there's, there's a lot. <laughs> so I, but if I give you, you know, 742 people, you know, the whole town of Canton right at the beginning, then um, it's going to be too overwhelming. So I wanted to try to condense it down to some of the main people that you're going to hear about right from the beginning. Also, some of the people that are going to be added onto this as we go, I didn't put them on here specifically because the way that I'm presenting the podcast, I'm going to do it. I did the introduction and I'm going to do it kind of, um, I'm going to do a deep dive on the evidence stuff so that I can show, you know, what the prosecution is saying versus what the defense is saying. And then we can pick holes and see, you know, what we, you know, what we believe on either side. But for the beginning, because there's so much, there's no possible way I could do an entire, you know, like full introduction and tell you who's who on every single person with, with a one hour podcast. So the way that I tried to, the way I decided to try to break it down is to show just the, from episode one is kind of just like, who's the, you know, the first statements, the first, you know, um, the PCA, which is its whole own other problem that we're going to go over. But this is just from the beginning. So um, for any of y'all who have been following the case, you know that there are more people that are going to end up becoming 
a part of this, but this is kind of who we're starting with. So um, this, you can see in the back, there's the house right there. That's the house where, um, where John O'Keefe's body was found out in the yard. Let me pull up my pictures too, because I want to show you, why are you whining? Come here. You all right? Quit whining. Um, I want to show, you want to sit with mama? Come here. No? Oh, let's see. All right. This is the, oops. Lucy's being needy. All right. So this is the house where this happened. Um, so before I get into who's who on the chart, let me kind of tell you what they are saying happened. This is the house where um, these two, Brian and Nicole, that's that's their home. Uh, the see the flagpole right here and the bushes right here. So this area right here is where John O'Keefe's body was found. What do you want? Um, oh, you want a treat. So what they're saying is that here, when they, they had been bar hopping, um, They'd gone to, uh, uh, John and Karen were at one bar. Uh, the Albert and McCabe families were at another one called Waterfall. They ended up going to meet them at Waterfall. They came back to this house because uh, Brian and Nicole, who live here, it was their son's birthday, Brian Jr. So they were like going to keep the party going, come over here, have drinks, whatever. So what they're saying happened is... Karen was driving. Uh, she's driving a Lexus SUV. And they're saying that she came and she was coming from this direction, came down here, uh, that she was drunk. She dropped John off. And they are saying that the prosecution is saying that she did a three point turn and ran over him and left him to die. Now, at this point, it had been um, it had been snowing for about 30 minutes, so there was snow on the ground, but it wasn't like a crazy amount yet. But they keep bringing up the snow, which is why I have the snow on the uh, cover, so much snow on the cover. This was the seventh largest blizzard in recorded Boston history. So, there's a lot of argument over the snow and what um, evidence was found because of the snow. And some of it they're saying, you know, was missed because of the snow. But then all of a sudden they found a ton of it after way more snow had fallen. So this picture right here is, of course, just from like Google Maps or whatever. This is not snow on the ground. But this kind of gives you an idea of where everything happened. Now, the car uh, that she was driving has a broken tail light, which is one of the things that um, you'll hear. Like, I think they even did a, what's it called? Nightline, uh, Nightline um, episode on the, or, ow, stop. Lucy's going nuts. Uh, segment on this. And they were even calling it like the tail light murder and stuff, because that's, that's, when you look at the car and then you look at the damage, his autopsy photos, they're saying that she ran over him, but the only thing on the car that's broken is the taillight. So that's why a lot of people are not really buying that story. Um, so that kind of gives you an idea of what happened. Okay, so now that's the house. Brian and Nicole are the ones who own that house. Nicole's sister, Jen McCabe, you will hear her name a lot. She is one of the kind of key players in this whole thing and um, and her phone records, especially. So you will hear a lot, hear her name a lot. And then this is her husband, Matt McCabe. Um, Brian Albert is 
Uh, he's also a Boston police officer. He, these are his brothers, uh, three of them, uh, Tim, Chris, and Kevin. Now, uh, he doesn't really come in until later. He doesn't really come in until later. Chris and Julie were at the bar. Julie will come in later. Um, but thank you, Lady and Gray. Hello, members for four months. Happy anniversary. I'm glad to have you four months already. Love this group. Brainy, JT, Lucy, Sir Elton, all the mods in the chat. We love you too. Thank you for being here. It, God, four months has gone by. It's gone by so fast. Um, all right. So uh, Chris Albert and Julie Albert, you will hear more about them later, especially Julie and her sister. But for now, uh, Chris Albert, uh, he is on the, um, the, the, it's a select board. That, the select board is not something that we have down South. It is not something that I even knew what it was. I had to look up what it is. You can see there are pictures of him and stuff um, that are uh, where he's got, you know, vote for uh, Chris Albert. And, you know, it's like elected officials, but it's like a handful of people. It's kind of it, 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 kind of like a city council type thing, I guess. Um, so uh, but it's one of those positions where, you know, it presents itself to having more connections. All right. So his son, Colin Albert, uh, is one that you will hear a lot too. So the part of a lot of the Twitter debate and the people who get so angry on Twitter is that a big part of the, you know, conspiracy, um, or theory or whatever you want to call it from the defense is that, Colin Albert was involved, which we'll get into that a little bit more later, but that one's, he's kind of a key player in this, but there's a lot of people that are, you'll see some, I'm not going to name names, but you'll see some people on Twitter who get really mad and, you know, try to shame anybody who says, you know, anything about him, but we have to look at reality and we have to look at facts and, and, he's, he's a part of, he's a part of this. So we have to look at it. Um, Chloe, um, is also one of the key players in this. Uh, Chloe is their German shepherd that they had. Brian Albert Jr. It was his birthday that night. So he had friends that were coming over, um, or he had friends that were already over. And then some of them had left. Some of them, uh, were still there. Some of them conveniently got left off the reports until later. So that's a whole nother thing. When I tell y'all it's messy, y'all, it is messy. So stop. She's so bad right now. She was like this last night too. Um, happy anniversary, Lynn in South Carolina. And happy anniversary, Lady Libra. I'm so glad to have y'all here. Both of you three months. All right, let's see. Uh, so Caitlin Albert. Um, so she is um, one of the daughters of Brian Albert. And she's an investigator for the Attorney General's office. Which, hello, hello, more connections there. So <laughs> let me jump in on this pile of love. Uh, happy anniversary, Canon Ann. We're glad to have you too. Um, <laughs> yeah, whistle if I tell her, Lindsay Henry, tell her, stop acting up. Uh, so Proctor is believed to be the one with the beef with the victim. So the one with the beef with the victim is actually Colin. Proctor is the lead uh, investigator in this from state police. And he was brought in so that there's no conflict with Canton police, but it ends up being even more of a conflict than it would have been if it was Canton police. So um, he's he's a lot closer to the family than he um, admitted. And there's even stuff in the in the uh, documents about how he went in and formally introduced himself to the Alberts and stuff like BS. He's, he knew them. He, they're in pictures together. He, he knew them well, um, very well. So, I mean, even like his, you know, his mom's social media and stuff like she's, you know, talking about, you know, how she just loves those Albert boys and stuff like that. So Lucy's over there throwing her toys now cause she's mad. She's not getting attention. Um, happy anniversary, Gailey May. I feel like I haven't seen, like, I just haven't been here because uh, I've been working on this. I haven't seen y'all in so long. So now it feels like everybody's anniversary because I haven't been here for everybody to be able to see it. Sylvia, happy anniversary. I'm glad to have y'all. Um, All right. So keep let's keep it going. All right. So Tristan um, is Caitlin's boyfriend. 
Now, something to note about Tristan, and I mentioned this in the podcast, uh, the court documents where they went to talk to Nicole. Um, <laughs> Nicole is the home, one of the homeowners, and they went to talk to her and get her statement about what had happened. And in the actual court documents, they say that Nicole said that she had gone to Waterfall, which is that bar and grill where they were all at earlier in the night. She had gone to Waterfall with her daughter, Tristan, and Tristan's boyfriend. Now, as you can clearly see here, her daughter is not Tristan. Her daughter is Caitlin and... Caitlin's boyfriend. So it's one of those things that if this is not only a family that, you know, it's stop. It's just one of those things that you would think is not, that's a huge mix up, a huge mix up. And one of so many, so many, oh my gosh, if y'all just wait until the next episode, the next episode is going to be all about the inconsistencies in the reports. Just wait, just wait. It, it, this gets so much more complicated and so much more crazy. So, um, but Tristan is the boyfriend, not the daughter, like the paper said. Um, I'm going to skip them for now because they are not coming up yet. Uh, Brian Higgins, he is another one of the people who was there that night. Um, he is ATF, but he also has an office in Canton Police Department. And he left the house um, after being out at the bar with them. He left the house and went, according to the statement, went to Canton Police Offices, Police Department to go do administrative work at like 1.30 in the morning. And this supposedly happened at like about like an hour before that. And he left to go do administrative work at Canton Police Department at 1.30 in the morning after being at the bar and grill with them all night. I think that's interesting. Carrie Roberts is, uh, she was not at the bar with them earlier, but she is, uh, you'll hear her name because she is one of the ones who was with Karen when Karen went to go find her, uh, to go find John. It was Carrie and then Jen McCabe, who, like I said, you will hear a lot of. And then of course, John O'Keefe. So that's kind of the who's who. Um, and then this is who was at the house. And like I said, that who's who is not even, that's just the, that's just who we're starting with for the first episodes. There's so much more that is going to have to be added in there. When I tell y'all that this is a mess, it is a mess. Olivia. <laughs> Hi, Olivia. Yep. I have. Uh, this is this is one of the theories that he could be there. Uh, he left at 1.30 to go to Canton Police Department so that he could be there for when the 911 call comes in for John so that he can influence the investigation. Now, normally, I'm not like huge on conspiracy theories. I'm like, OK, well, normally, like, you know, the simplest explanation is is the explanation. The reason that this one piqued my interest is because. You know, I go into everything thinking like I, I I tune out the mess, you know, like there's always going to be loud people on each side. Give me the facts. Y'all know how I am. Give me the data. Give me the data. So I took the reports that are the actual data and I put them all in a timeline. And so now I'm like, OK, so this is what I'm starting with. I know that these are the facts. These are the things that I can rely on. That's the number one thing that I know. I know for a fact this entire column is factual and accurate and true. However, <laughs> then I take the rest of the court documents and I'm looking and I'm like, well, that doesn't add up. Well, that doesn't add up. Well, that doesn't line up. Well, this doesn't make sense. And normally court documents and the official documents are not so out of touch with the data that it's already red flags. I mean, you know, testimony, statements from, you know, people that are, you know, like their own written statements, things like that, sure. But the actual official court documents and the things from the lead investigator and stuff like that, there should not be that many red flags right from the beginning. And that's why this one really caught my, ow, stop. 
Lucy's bad. She's going to the pound. Um, but that's why this one really caught my attention. So we're going to go over a lot of that because y'all, it gets, it gets wild. Um, okay. So this is who is at the house. So this is Brian and Nicole. Now I made a note on here too, um, per Nicole's statement. Now this is an official statement, y'all. This is, you know, entered into public record, uh, that she met her daughter, Tristan and her boyfriend there. And like I said, Tristan is not her daughter. Tristan is her daughter's boyfriend and Caitlin is her daughter. Uh, Caitlin, again, who works for the attorney general's office, uh, Jen McCabe and Nicole Albert are sisters. Jen McCabe is, um, the one who we are going to talk about her cell phone history because that's a doozy and her search history. Um, if you've seen anything on this case, um, you've probably heard of the two different, the, the two biggest arguments in this are the taillight and how long to die in the cold. And it was, when I started looking into this, it was how long to die in the cold that really was like, oh, yep, I got to cover this one. Like, this has got to be, um, I have to dig into this one uh, because the there are a lot of things that can be explained away. BG, happy anniversary. I'm so glad you're here. There are a lot of things that can be explained away in anything. Like, I mean, there's, you know, some, some things are not as, you know, as much of like a bomb dropped as some other things. But the reason that she ends up becoming such a huge part of this is because she Googled at 2.27 a.m. how long to die in the cold. And that was hours before she, along with Karen, she went with Karen and they discovered his body. And all of a sudden, you know, they have a search history from her that was deleted, by the way. And they got it because they did the complete like, download of her phone. So they found that that's not one of those things that you can really explain away. So they try, Oh, they try. Um, and they, they try to say, they try to go around their bum to get there to their elbow, you know, trying to explain it away, but their explanation of how it can be explained doesn't make sense. So we, we're, we're not stupid this is not our first trial that we've, you know, covered. This is not our first case that we've looked at. We all know how Celebrite works. It's not like this is not rocket science. This is, you know, you you downloaded it, it you download it and you look at it and and then you know what you're looking at. So this is uh these uh two were there that night too. They don't get talked about a whole lot. The only thing that's really brought up um especially towards the beginning of the investigation, you know, like, but th there is a statement where she's, you know, talking about how she um, had talked to Karen while they were out that night and that she uh, had complained about not having privacy and think that normal things that we complain about when there's, you know, youngins around all the time. So that's really the only contribution th at this point that there has been made with them being at the bar as well. They went there after their daughter's uh, basketball game. Uh, we are all celebrite experts. Yes. Yes. I feel like I could totally be called in uh, as an expert. All right. So let me get my handy dandy timeline. This isn't the full one because I just want to, I'm, I'm going to do these, like I could sit here for literally nine hours and go over all this information. But I've already got a horse voice and I'm tired and I've been at the oncologist all morning. And so we're not going to do a nine hour stream. We're going to do, I'm basically going to go over everything that was in the, um, where is my, oh, there it is. Uh, everything that was in the first podcast, the, um, uh, Where is it? Timeline. All right. So, oops. Y'all know how I am about my timelines. And I haven't like done this one like to like, y'all know how I like to 
make them all fancy and clean them up. This is just like the working timeline because I still haven't even filtered in some of the other stuff. But all right. So I want to go over. This is the stuff that I went over in the uh, podcast episode as far as the timeline stuff goes. Here's what's here's what's important to notice. OK, the um, I had things highlighted for different. Let me make sure I didn't like write any like, hey, this dude's a douche or anything on here. Let me make sure I don't have any like rude comments on here before I. Sometimes I make my own little comments and then, um, nope, I'm good. Look at me behaving. Okay. All right. So, um, let's see if we can zoom in a little bit. Cause I know that's hard to see. All right. So John and Karen get to the waterfall bar and grill about 11 o'clock. So over here, there's different, like, depending on who says what about who. Um, so according to, I'm not going to read like line for line. I want to give, because that gets boring. I want to give kind of details about what's important from each of these. So from like 1215 to 1220, you can see because they've they've now they're leaving Waterfall Bar. Uh, Jen McCabe has said, "Hey, you know, we're going to my sister's house. Uh, you know, y'all should come along, have drinks, whatever." Um, so they're planning on going there. They leave the bar. You can see there are, uh, you know, there's video footage, and you can see them leave about the same time. Nothing mind blowing there. Now, one thing to note is that. Uh, John has a glass in his hand when he leaves the bar. So he took a glass with him. He still has it in his hand. And that comes up um, later because they find broken glass. So that's that's the biggest thing from seeing that part of it. Now, there's, uh, there's some of the inconsistencies. And we'll get more like the next. Can y'all hear her whining? Do you hear her? You're bad. Um, so the uh, the February 1st interview that you'll see on here, and then that's with Jen McCabe. And then the uh, PCA, first of all, actually, before we even get started on this, let's pull that PCA. Because let me tell y'all, um, y'all know that normally, normally, I like to... Uh, Pull, I like all the court documents because I feel like those are the things that are generally the most reliable, right? Wrong. The PCA in this is a, well, depending on which PCA, let's be honest. Um, there's, uh, let's see. Let me pull this up real quick because um, there's, a, there's, there's a lot of key things. What did I just do? That ain't it. Oh, here it is. Okay. See if. All right. So the PCA, the application for the PCA, remember that I told y'all Proctor has connections to the Alberts. So when the 911 call comes in and Canton is supposed to be, you know, that's their jurisdiction, they are, uh, they decide to bring in state police instead so that there's no, you know, um, conflict of interest. There's, you know, whatever. So they had, um, she's throwing her toys again. Um, they had trooper Proctor come in and he's the one who does the, 
you know, he's, he's the lead investigator. There is nothing in any of the official papers, of course, about how like he's pictured with, you know, Alberts in, you know, social media stuff. And, you know, his um, Colin, the one who is kind of at the, <clears throat> he's one of the main ones in the defense theory about, you know, what they believe could have happened. The, um, uh, <laughs> the, I mean, there's it, like one of them was in his sister's wedding and stuff. I mean, like to, to pretend like this is going to be a, you know, clean, you know, non-biased, you know, person coming in to do, you know, to take care of this is mind blowing. So, uh, he gives information he received a 911 call or not he, but you know, they received 911 call. Uh, he was, John O'Keefe was discovered unresponsive. Um, Canada police fire EMS responded to the scene. Okay. So they were dispatched for an unresponsive male discovered outside in the snow. CPR was in progress. Canton EMS, uh, transported victim to good Samaritan hospital. He was determined to be deceased. So prior to being discovered, the victim was at waterfall bar. That's the bar we talked about earlier. And then traveled to Fairview Road for a gathering with friends. President Waterfall Bar uh, and the residence on Fairfield Road was Jennifer McCabe. Um, so this is, oh, wait, this is not right. This is not the, oh, this is the interview. This isn't the PCA. Dang. Let's see. Well, we can look at this. Too. Well, no, because that's that defeats all purpose to do another thing. Well, let me see. Um, I thought that was PCA. Um, here it is. I have so many dang court documents saved on my computer. Okay. Zoom in. Cause y'all know I'm blind. All right, let's see. So he gives his little resume. Uh, all right, so at 6.04 a.m., they received a 911 call from a woman saying they found John in the snow. Um, for me, CPR. Okay, so officer observed the victim to be cold to the touch, not breathing, and returned to his cruiser to retrieve his AED device. Um, at this time, Canton Fire and EMS arrived on the scene and took over first aid. Paramedics transported O'Keefe to Good Samaritan Hospital in Brockton, and he was determined to be deceased several hours later. Um, uh, let's see, where is the, okay, they discovered a, all right, so that broken cocktail glass. It says they discovered a broken cocktail style glass and multiple patches of red that appeared to be blood in the vicinity of the victim. So they secured the glass and six blood samples as evidence. So the six blood samples as evidence, she's still wanting the six blood samples as evidence um, were in solo cups. That's they were. That's not here. Hold on. I'm going to pull up the picture. Um, oh, here it is. Here, I'm going to use Turtle Boys. Ow. This is on Turtle Boys' website. I mentioned him in the podcast. I've talked to him a little. Stop. Lucy's going to drive me nuts, y'all. This is, uh, this is how they collected. Have you ever seen... Um, have you ever seen blood collected in a solo cup? Six solo cups? 
Thank you for being a member for four whole months. Happy anniversary. Uh, yeah, she's, she, I've been gone all morning. So she's like, she's just being obnoxious. Do you want to stay with me? You stay with me? Come here. Fine. She's over there pouting. Um, all right. So, uh, six, six solo cups. Um, and then there's autopsy photos on there too, but we'll get into that part later. That's part of what, when, where the Chloe comes in too. Um, all right. So, uh, let, da, 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 let's see. Um, okay. So I requested to speak <clears throat> with Jen McCabe and her husband, Matt, they both agreed to speak with us. We first spoke with Jennifer who stated that her and some friends were at waterfall bar last night in Canton. Jennifer stated that her and Matthew arrived at the waterfall bar approximately nine at 11. John and Karen arrived. John and Karen have been in a dating relationship for two years and Karen stays at John's house most nights. Jennifer observed Karen walking into the bar holding a glass cup from C.F. McCarthy's with clear liquid inside, what she believed to be vodka and a drink. Uh, John wearing a baseball cap, jeans, and sneakers. They were at C.F. McCarthy's bar across the street before coming to Waterfall, and Jennifer stated that John and Karen appeared to be in a good mood, did not observe any arguing amongst the two. Now, there's video footage of them there, too. And um, the video footage, I mean, like, they're they look happy. They look, you know, like arms around each other. Like, I mean, there's, there's no like fighting and all of that. There was, um, I think she had said, um, before that, uh, in one of the statements or something it had said that they had, you know, fussed that morning. But I mean, you can tell like looking at them, like they're not, you know, they're not fighting and, you know, like they're not, there's, there's no, Ten, you can tell there's no tension in the in the video. Um, so let's see. Uh, as the bar began to close down, everyone was invited back to Fairfield Road. Um, Jen observed Karen and John leave Waterfall Bar together. As the group was exiting, John texted Jennifer where to 1214 a.m. Okay, so just something to note. These times that he gives on here are... Some of them are accurate and some of them are not. And the reason that I want to point that out is because if there's like one or two things here or there that are like, you know, she said that she thinks at about 12 o'clock, you know, she did this or like they're saying, you know, around 11 o'clock they got there. Okay, fine. But when they're saying like at 1222, you know, in 35 seconds, they did that. No, like there are things that they're giving very specific times that are wrong. And that's a huge deal when it comes to having the, you know, having so many documents and statements and stuff like these are official records that have wrong times and wrong information on them. And that's a huge deal because how can you know, if they don't even know what happened, then how can, you know, and, and they're stating these things as fact, like this is, you know, this is what happened. This is the time. This is the timestamp on this. So if they're giving you different facts as to what happened and they don't even know, that's a problem. So that was big, you know, big red flag number one. Uh, so he's giving times about, you know, pull up behind me and uh, all that stuff. All right. So uh, where is it? Um, J Jennifer texted John hello and then observed the black SUV drive away. Okay. So this whole, this whole section right here, let's talk about this section because this is, this is a problem <laughs> because this is coming from, Jen McCabe, supposedly, but her story changes about what happened. Uh, there are, let me get back to the other part so we can look at this. The, um, fair forward. Okay. So those texts and everything they were talking about, and I put deleted on some of the stuff that was deleted. So here's, here's the problem there are times when, um, like according to the PCA, something's different. Okay. So Jen said, according to this document that we were just looking at, right. At this point, they're going to the, you know, to the house, Jen McCabe gets there before them and she's expecting them to come up. And she says, according to the PCA, she tells them that, um, you know, she saw a car, 
you know, viewed the car out the window that was in front of the house. And then she saw, you know, saw it, assumed it was them, was texting like, you know, hey, hello, are you here? Pull up behind me, whatever. And then according to the PCA, it says that Jen saw the car move from the original spot in front of the house to the left of the house. Now, that picture that we had... So this is basically saying that they saw the car move from like, it would have been parked like right here to now it's over here. Okay. So let's look at all the problems with that. The, um, the, the birthday celebration that was going on was for Brian Jr. One of Brian Jr.'s friends that he had with him at the house had called her brother, Ryan, to come pick her up, according to these documents. So Ryan tells the grand jury that he showed up at 1215, which we know that that time's not right because of other stuff. But that, you know, that could be, him saying 1215 could just be a guess, whatever. It's not that, that far off. But regardless, um, so Ryan says that when he was turning on this road, he had to yield to a uh, black SUV that was the black Lexus SUV that Karen was driving. He yields to that SUV that turns in um, and then he turns in behind them. So now they're both driving along Fairfield Road right here. And Karen and John are in the car in front of Ryan and Ryan was in an F-150 truck with his friend and his girlfriend. So they are in like right in line behind Karen and John. Right. So according to his statements or his testimony to grand jury, the SUV pulled up immediately toward the left of the yard. So more on this area and he pulled up directly in front of the house okay so why does nothing in any of the other stuff say anything about that i think that it's strange that you know jen is saying according to these documents jen is saying that i looked out the front of the i looked out the front door and i saw the you know, the SUV and she said she can't describe it because she's not good at that kind of thing. But she said she looked out and she saw the SUV and um, it was, you know, right in front of the house. And she doesn't say anything about I looked out and, you know, I saw an SUV in a truck or I looked out and I saw a truck and a car or I looked out and saw two cars or anything like that. So, like, here we are at the very beginning of the investigation and the statements and this is before we've gotten to anything else. Like this is just the very beginning and there's already discrepancies. So why, why is that part not brought up in either the PCA or, you know, the interview with her that was filed as well? So the, that's, that's one of the first, very first inconsistencies. And trust me, there's going to be a lot. <laughs> that's why I said I could sit here and do like, the last few weeks I've spent going over this stuff, I could sit here for nine hours, but I'm trying to keep y'all just at the very beginning of the investigation right now so that I can kind of help walk through how everything unfolds. So that's red flag number one, right? All right. So the, it says Jen saw the car move from the original spot in front of the house to the left of the house. So it says that she saw the car move from the front, which Ryan said that it was already to the left a little bit, but his statement to grand jury does say that they moved further to the left. So um, over here by <clears throat> like by the flagpole. But so one statement from Jen says she saw the car move from the original spot in front of the house to the left of the house. But then there's another statement from her that says, uh, the you know the next time she looked out uh the car or she the next time she looks out the window the car was gone so this is one statement this is according to her february 1st interview then you have 
where is it? Uh, looks at looks out the window and the car is gone. Then, in, but in the PCA that we were just reading, she texts him and says hello, and then she saw the car drive away. So here we are again. We're literally in the first fifteen minutes of the investigation, and there's already two major discrepancies. So that's that's a big problem. The in in. And the reason why this is not just one of those things like, you know, oh, I can't remember who pulled out in front of who when we left the bar. It's not that they are saying that a man lost his life because he was hit by a car in front of this house and left to die. So if you can't. If you can't give accurate details about what cars were in front of your house. And what you are sure you saw at the time in question, that's a problem. If you don't know, it should be, I think this happened. She believes this may have happened. But to give two very specific statements about what you saw and what you witnessed and them not add up. And one of them was done on February 1st. So this is not like one of those cases that we see where they're having to, you know, question somebody on the stand three years later who's trying to remember things. This is this is all within a short time frame. And those are very, very important details. And for them to not add up, that's a huge problem. So the um, and then, of course, like the text and stuff like that, like I said, like a lot of those don't add up either. And they're not correct on the forms. Not only do they not add up to the actual data, but they don't even add up with each other. So that's another problem. All right. On to the next big discrepancy in the timeline. Um, so in one statement, she just looks out the window and then the car is gone. In the other statement, she texted him hello and then saw him drive away. What she doesn't mention is that there was a call to him that she deleted from her phone um, that she calls. And uh, and this is supposedly the time that he they had pulled up and that they were, you know, because um, uh, he his phone data because y'all know how I am. I want to go by the data and then everything else I'll filter in and I don't give it as much credit, but the phone location data shows that he arrived at 1224. So it's five minutes later that I was like, it's been a long day. So I was like five minutes. Is that math right? Yes. 24 to 29 is five minutes. Thank you. Um, so five minutes later, she calls him and they talk for eight seconds and that's deleted from the phone. Now an eight second phone call, not a huge deal, but it is a huge deal when Again, here we are at the time in question. We don't know if they, you know, like one of the biggest arguments is whether or not he ever made it into the house. And here she is saying, oh, I don't know. You know, I thought I saw them pull up and then, you know, I saw them pull away or I looked out again and, you know, people like, you know, I, th they drove away. I don't, like, you know, that's, that's all good and well, but you called him. You talk to him at the time when then say, they're saying that he died. How do you, number one, forget that. And number two, you deleted it from your phone, which is automatically not going to look good. Like innocent people, you know, have deleted things before because they think it could, you know, um, come back, you know, to look bad. But if you don't have anything to hide, there would be nothing bad about that. Like if you, you know, let's say you're worried about getting in trouble and, you know, you sent something about how you, you know, I don't know. What do people get in trouble for? Like, or think they're going to get in trouble for like, oh, I, you know, smoked a bunch of pot and streaked through the football game. Whatever people do. I don't know what the kids are doing these days. I have no life other than this. So there are things that you would delete because you're worried about getting in trouble. Sure. But the, these phone calls people really go streaking anymore? Is that a thing? I don't want to know. Don't send me clips. Um, but to delete something like that and to delete something that important and to not tell them 
something that important that you spoke to the victim for eight seconds at the time in question when you're thinking that, you know, they're thinking that this is the time that he was killed and you had a conversation with him for eight seconds. That's a big problem. That's a big problem. So for that to not only not be mentioned, but to be deleted, that's another big red flag. <laughs> Trudy said they do in England at cricket matches. I'm streaking. Teach their own. Um, so this looks bad. All right. So according to grand jury statements, remember how I mentioned Colin and how he's like a big part of this. Um, now I'll tell you both sides on the whole Colin thing. Um, if you listen to like, let's say, you know, former FBI agents and stuff like that, you know, they're like, Oh, well he, you know, he was only, what was he? 18, 19 at the time, 18. Um, you know, he's just an innocent kid and stuff like that. Um, and part of me, you know, is like, okay, you know, yeah, I don't like, you don't want to bring any, you know, anybody innocent in it. But at the same time, if, if, officials are not giving us all of the facts that we're kind of having to find them on our own as we're digging and, you know, and defense attorneys and investigators and stuff too. He's not just like, you know, like an, an innocent 18 year old, just, you know, who was going home to study. Like he's, there have been, this isn't just like somebody's, you know, random nephew who John had never met before. There had been tension between them before. So, it's not even like just he was some random kid. There is a connection there and they had conflict in the past. So obviously when there's conflict in the past, you know, and now all of a sudden here's, you know, and he can be known as kind of a hothead. And um, so, so it, I want to be real careful with how I talk about this part because because I don't know what happened and I don't want to, I, I want to be very careful about reporting on facts and theories. I, I have my own beliefs, but I want to be very careful about how I report on this. Th there are factors that go into him as well as other members of the family that are things to make note of when you are trying to take in the totality of all of the information together. So, um, uh, yes, life lessons, Colin and John had conflict before. Um, so he, he has been part of some of the debate on this along with some of the others in the house. It's so hard too because I want to give all of the information so that everybody can, you know, make up your own minds about things. But there, there, <laughs> there's so much sneakiness happening in this case. So it's it's hard. It's it's hard. Um. All right. Let's see. Uh, Phoenix Rising. When they got her, all the deleted calls and everything. When they got her phone. They got those um, when they did like the full download of her phone. Um, so she had, you know, the condition of the phone was, I mean, like she, you know, condition of the phone was fine, but this is from the, the full Celebrite download. And this is, you know, when the defense expert, they had like one of the, you know, cell phone data dudes who can come in and tell you everything about everything. And, you know, if you've ever looked up something you shouldn't have, it's going to show up. It was one of those dudes and he came in and he does a report. And I mean, it's clear as day. You can see it. And they try to explain that away and say, oh, no, it, you know, that was from the next morning. And it just says 227 because of, you know, this and this and this. No, ma'am. No, ma'am, Pam. We can see it right there. 227. All right. So moving right along. Um, the. 
inconsistencies there. All right. No. So now let's talk about leaving the house. Let's talk about leaving the house. Another inconsistency. Hey, 80s. Sneaky, sneaky. Speaking of sneaky, 80s is here. Um, all right. The, um, I see, uh, yeah, John O'Keefe had called in and reported on drug dealing in his neighborhood, uh, which, um, so where's my little who's who? All right. So, oh, where's my other one? So Chris Albert, um, the brother of Brian Albert, where they were, uh, his son is Colin. And um, so John, the victim, calling in and reporting on drug dealing in his neighborhood where this family lives. Um, and Kevin is their other brother who is Canton Police Department. And so uh, intercepting the phone calls. So the victim calls report. Yeah. What, what, like, look, when I tell y'all it gets messy, like, it, <laughs> it, it uh, we're, uh, we could be here for a while. Yeah. It, it gets it, like, I thought this was going to be a great one. And then I started researching and I was like, every time I thought I had it down, then more stuff would happen. And I was like, oh, this is where I live now. I just, I don't, I just, I'll never, I'll just never sleep again. This is just my life now in this chair. Um, all right. So, uh, and I'm going to do a whole, one whole episode is going to be on just the Alberts and their connections tentacles. Uh, when I tell y'all I'm tired, <laughs> this is why, this is why you have no idea how crazy this gets. All right. So, um, I'm trying to keep it simple for the beginning. Cause I know that this is a lot of, a lot of our community. This is the first time you've heard a lot of, of this stuff. All right. So let's move right along. Now, um, the next little time block that we have is now that this is when they're talking about leaving, right? So depending on what statement, and I mentioned this in the podcast too, depending on what statement uh, you you take, um, some of them are like, oh yeah, everybody had left by 1 a.m. And then which, okay, they left at one, but they got there to hang out at 1230. So who drives out of their way to go hang out for 30 minutes? Not saying it can't happen. But that's one of those, maybe not a red flag, maybe a yellow flag. We call that like a yellow flag. An orange flag, perhaps. It's just something to take note of. All of a sudden, everybody's leaving at one, even though they just got there 30 minutes before. I'm sorry, but if i am been drinking and I'm tired, I ain't going to go hang out with nobody for 30 minutes. Either we're about to go get crunk. Do kids still say crunk? They could. Um... All right, so maybe. Uh, oh, we have gifted membership. ML gifted. Oh, I've missed these. Oh, I'm so bad. Amy H51 gifted five memberships. I haven't even been looking at that screen. I'm so bad. I'm sorry. Um, Amy H51, thank you for gifting five memberships. ML gifted a membership and Amos gifted five memberships. Thank y'all so much. I appreciate y'all. Y'all are the best. Y'all saw how we're getting close now to 10,000, aren't we? Let me see what we are. We were, um, we're at 9,189 subscribers now. That's kind of cool. We're getting close. All right. Thank you for the gifted memberships, y'all. I appreciate it. Okay. Um, 
All right, let's see. So we have uh, one o'clock is where, like, um, according to a grand jury statement and then another um, uh, memorialized statement interview thing or whatever, uh, one o'clock was when everybody had left. Okay. Um, according to Jen McCabe on her interview on February 1st, she says that her and her husband, Matt, left her sister's house um, at 1.30. And then they drove Brian Jr.'s two friends home, I think is how it worded it. Okay, but then in another statement, it doesn't say that she drove them both home. It says that she drove Julie home. We didn't even find out about Sarah until... I don't, I don't, I'd have to pull up all the documents. I have, I have my little notes on who, which document had what and which bombshells were dropped on what, but again, conflicting document statements. Um, she says one thirty. Okay. It was actually, um, uh, one thirty seven is when her steps on her phone and her watch stopped, uh, recording uh, steps. So that would be about the time that she left. Um, her phone location data that shows that she was no longer in the area, um, left at 1 47 AM. Um, so that's another thing though, her phone location data. And this is something I'm going to look at in, on a future episode too. Um, her phone stops recording steps. Um, she leaves. Oh, this was it. Her course is reversed. So this, I'm not going to get into too much of this now. I, cause I still have two things I want to check on with this because I need to pull the, my map stuff, but her phone location data shows her leaving at 1 47, uh, turning going Leonard way course is reversed. And then she arrives at home at two twelve. Um, and then this is where, th this is where the big, the big kicker is. At 2.27 and 40 seconds, that's when she does that internet search for how long to die in the cold. And she spells it wrong. And the reason that's important is because part of the... Um, do you want another treat? Is that why you want it? Um, part of the way that they're trying to explain this away is that, oh, well, you know... They, she Googled that again because uh, when they got there with Karen and they saw John in the snow, um, you know, she, that Karen had hollered out to her, you know, hey, Google how long it you know takes to die in the cold, whatever. So they're saying that's why she Googled it. But the reason that it's so, so, so important that she spelled this wrong is because the next time that she Googles this, she doesn't spell it like this. She Googles it another two times, actually, and she spells it wrong again the next time um but she spells it wrong here and the next time she googles it she doesn't spell it the same so there are times where if you google something and then you like close your stuff or whatever i've seen it in cases before where if you open it back up then um you know if if you you hadn't finished the thing yet or whatever like it can if you open it back up and you had typed that in, then it can process it and make it go through. So then it'll look like the search happened when you opened it back up. So if, if that second search had been spelled the same, then even that would have only accounted for the second one. It's not going to all of a sudden jump to being a 230 or 227 search because you did it at 604 and you had something typed in before. So the only way that I've ever even seen any, anybody be able to explain away a search history has been explaining away a current one because of a past one. You can't explain a past one away because of a current one. So it's not something that even makes sense. And, and, on top of all of that, surprise, surprise, it's one of the things that's deleted in the phone. So it's not a good look there at all. Um, all right. So 
the plow driver. <laughs> Lucky the plow driver. I'm going to do a whole, I'm going to do a whole episode on Lucky the plow driver. So I will give you just the very bare minimum episode or uh, of information on this part. Now, there is a plow driver who, there's so much controversy over the plow driver. <laughs> um, the uh, plow driver, um, according to the interview, this is how they word it in the interview, which I realized does this math ain't mathing. Um, in the interview, they say that um, it says that from 2.30 to 3.00, the plow driver Lucky sees a Ford Edge parked in front of 34 Fairview Road toward the left of the property facing Chapman, which is exactly where John's body, I say, I don't say exactly, it's in the same area toward the left of the property. Um, that's the same area where John's body was found. That's the same area where they said that um, uh, Karen had dropped him off or whatever. So, he says that he sees a Ford Edge parked there. Um, and I think he said in there that it was for parked there for at least an hour. Um, I think is what the statement said. I have it on my lucky tab. I'll have to, like I said, this, the plow driver thing is a whole nother mess and that's going to be a whole episode on its own. So, uh, but he says that he saw it there for less than an hour, but then on this part of it, it says from 233. Anyway, the point is he saw a Ford edge. Okay. So here's my problem. One of, one of, one of my other problems. <laughs> um, why? First of all, the, the, there are arguments about, um, Uh, there are arguments about, um, I lost my train of thought because I just looked at that email, uh, about the name of the plow company and them, you know, not making any effort to talk to Lucky. Um, that is going to be a whole nother, and, and that part gets wild too, y'all. Uh, but when they finally when he is finally talked to, let me say it like that. When he is finally talked to, um, <laughs> what a, that's exactly what I'm trying to say. True. Come junkie. I listened last night. What a cluster. Yes. That's what I'm saying. When I say it's hard, like recording this has been so hard because there's so much that if I, there's no way to put it all in one episode. So I have to try to lay it out to where it's e easily, you know, understandable. <laughs> And man, oh man, is that hard when there's so much information. So, um, so I'm trying to just start from the beginning of, you know, of the investigation. And then as the investigation goes along, I'll show you how much of a crap show it became. All right. So, uh, they don't talk to Lucky. Um, when he finally is actually asked about, um, you know, plowing that road. Uh, he says that he did not see a body and he says he would have seen a body. Um, now I don't know if y'all know anything about snow plowing. I didn't, uh, I did not know anything about snow plowing until, um, uh, uh, that, that, dude I was married to. He, he drove a snowplow. So, um, I have seen the argument made on, um, on Twitter that, oh, well, you know, John's body was, um, there are so many different, like, you know, some people are saying like, oh, well, he was, you know, hit by a plow. And some people are saying, well, he was covered in snow, so they wouldn't have seen him anyway. And, um, but I saw one of the arguments was, well, it wasn't snowing that much yet, so they wouldn't have needed a plow. That's not how plowing works. The plows also have, um, like where they put out the salt and then, or beet juice that like sometimes, I mean, it's like a mixture of salt and beet, beet juice. Um, if it's like, impacted snow or if there's like ice or something like the beet juice helps to break it down and it makes the salt last longer. Anyway, that's beside the point. So 
they have like the plows don't just plow like they have they they throw salt and stuff too to help with the roads that's the whole point of them being out there and they start before the snow gets bad because it helps to keep the you know roads from getting bad so whether there's you know two inches of snow or two feet of snow there will still be plows out there with their salt trucks so i've heard that like somebody thought that they had proved that you know something because of that i'm like no that's not how that works like you still have um like the the plow driver still there and because they have i remember i used to talk to the dude i was married to about this like you know he'd be complaining about it they have um the way that they have it set up like you sit up so high and the way that they have the lights, they have the lights that face out because they said, he said that like, you know, they have to have everything and they have to like check all this stuff too, to make sure that, um, he said people will be out there like, you know, uh, shoveling their sidewalks and stuff like that. So they have to, um, I forget what it's called, but like the way that their thing throws snow to the side, like it kind of like, you know, it's like kind of shifted like this or whatever, and it throws it to the side. They have um, like their lights that are, are on the trucks are really bright right there because they have to watch for people who are shoveling their sidewalks and stuff like that. So it's not like there's like, you know, little visibility here. Those trucks are specifically made to have high visibility in that area that they're talking about. So that's a that's, you know, if he says that he didn't see a body there, then that's believable you know, because let me rephrase. I believe him that there wasn't one because he has high visibility in that area. And that's something that they are trained to have to pay attention to um, because, you know, people or cars or bikes or whatever. So it's something that's, you know, that makes sense. But it's also not something that they even talked to him about in the beginning, which is um, which is crazy. If you know that the snowplow driver came right by the area where there may have been a body at any point in time, would you not want to talk to that snowplow driver? Um, so, yeah. Um, all right. So then at 430, John's niece is woken up by Karen. Um now, if you didn't listen to the podcast and you don't know, um, John was raising his niece and his nephew. His, uh, his, like, it's it's really sad. It's one of those things, like, you know, he's, he's a, it, it kind of just shows who he is as a person. He's, you know, a um, uh, good dude. But he was raising his niece and nephew. So in the house where he lived, uh, Karen had gone back there and... She got a treat. Now she's happy. Uh, Karen had gone back there and she had gone to sleep or whatever after she dropped John off, had gone back there and gone to sleep. So she wakes up. John's at home. She starts panicking, freaking out. So um, she wakes up John's niece. And according to statement, uh, the niece calls. Uh, like freaking out because, uh, or the niece calls because Karen's freaking out or whatever, um, because he didn't come home. So Jen gets this call from Kaylee, John's niece. And, um, according to the February 1st interview, which again, this is something that is, um, uh, Oh, uh, yeah, half hammer. Actually, I, I mentioned this in the podcast. If the um, <laughs> I briefly mentioned this because, like I said, we're going to get more into it later. But they only talked to Lucky after. Um, what do you want now? I gave you one. Um, after uh, he had been contacted and uh, talk to, there you go. Um, <laughs> to turtle boy. So 
I mean, if that doesn't tell you everything you need to know about how this investigation is going. Um, all right. So uh, according to the February 1st interview, Jen says that Karen called and believes that she left him at Waterfall. Um, right after that, again, you see all the deleted calls. Jen calls John, deleted it. And then Carrie Roberts, the friend who went with him, Carrie Roberts gets a call from Karen. John didn't come home and said, Karen said, um, now this is according to the statement that Karen said, John's dead. Carrie, Carrie, I wonder if he's dead. It's snowing. He got hit by a plow. So, um, I mean, you can see how many, like, you know, deleted calls and stuff. All right. So this part is another part that everybody's up in a roar about the backing out of the garage. So the tail light is at the center of the, um, the controversy, the debate, um, anger, hatred, <laughs> attacks, all that stuff. Um, if you look at the car, it's just the tail light. That's it. That's the only part that's messed up on the car. Now, granted, I have not seen pictures of the underneath of the car. And the whole thing is they're saying that she like ran over him. But if you ran over him, I don't understand how they... Their math ain't math and to me. That's just me personally. I would need an expert to explain to me exactly how they think that that part would work out. To me, it doesn't make sense, but I'm I'm a Celebrite expert. I'm a ballistics expert. I'm a lot of experts at this point, but that is not an expertise that I can make sense of. So I don't get it, but that's that's their story and they're sticking to it. So the taillight being broken is one of their biggest, you know, aha gotcha, right? But then out comes this video and you can see Karen pulling out of the garage and she's parked. This is the garage at John's house. You can see her backing up and she backs up. And I, I saw this video that they were saying, oh, yeah, it shows her backing up and she hits John's car. And that's how she broke the taillight. And you can you know see that she hits the car. And I watched it and I was like, I don't see her hit that car. And so I was like, OK, well you know, I'll slow it down. I'll look again. I don't see her hitting the car. So I slow it down and I zoom in on the tire. Like, um, you know how like you can see like the, like not the tire, I guess the wheels. Um, so I'm like, okay, this gives me like a point of, you know, to watch this. And you can see when you slow it up just frame by frame, you can see that wheel and you zoom in, you can see that wheel budge, which I'm like, okay, well, maybe, okay, well, maybe she did hit the car. I didn't think she did when I first saw it, though, I'll be honest. When I zoom in and I play it frame by frame, I can see it. But I did not think, I thought that they were all crazy. Um, of course, I also, you know, wasn't wearing my old lady glasses when when I first saw it. So maybe that has something to do with it, too. But, um, you, but you can see it, or I can, I can see it once I slow it down and look. So now I'm like, okay, well maybe there really is something to, you know, to all of this. So that video shows her backing out of the garage, striking the car behind her, which is John's car, and then leaving, going, you know, out to go search for him. The, look at all these deleted calls and everything. Um, let's see, let's get to, all right. So here's the other searches. Um, how long at 623 in the morning, Jen searches, how long does it take to digest food? When have you ever seen, let me rephrase. Every time that you've ever seen anything about somebody Googling, how long does it take to digest food? What has it always been in reference to? Dead bodies, right? Either somebody's doing it because of their own whatever, or 
we're looking it up for a trial. I don't think I've ever seen anybody Google how long does it take to digest food if they're not trying to figure out some kind of time of death type deal. So again, it's one of those things that is super suspicious to me. To me. Um, she's a bad dog. At 623.49, she Googles, Jen Googles, how long does it take to digest food? And then right after that, she Googles, how long does it take to die in the cold again? And you can see it's spelled wrong again. Um, and then right after that, then she does, uh, does it again. And this time she does the HOS instead of the HOW. Now, if you Google stuff and you've spelled it wrong before and you go to type it in. Um, if you go to type it in, then you can see, thank you, Deborah. I appreciate that. You can see sometimes it will pop up with how you've spelled it before again. So it's possible that, you know, that if she goes to pull it up and as soon as you type in H O, um, you can like click on the option from where you've done it like that before. So, um, but I mean, this is 624. All right. Something else to notice the, um, and I haven't added it all in yet because I haven't finished this yet because if y'all had any idea how time consuming this is, you would understand why I am always sleep deprived and can't keep up with my thoughts. Um, her time or her, uh, health data. I mentioned this in the podcast too. All during this time, she has an, she has a watch and a phone and her step data shows that she does not stop moving. So she goes home. Um, Uh, 147, she goes home. Um, she's, um, turning here, going there, courses reverse, you know, keep in mind she's dropping people off. And then she arrives home at 212. And then 15 minutes later, she does that search on how long to die in the cold. The first search. So she's home at 212 and her steps don't show another pause in steps or like where she's not taking any until she is back in the car again on the way to go to um, look for John with Karen. I think that that's interesting because if she got home I mean, and maybe it's just the old lady and me, but y'all, if I'm out, you know, drinking with my friends and I get home, especially that late at night, I'm, I'm going to be asleep. I'm going to be passed out before I get home. So to get home and, for, you know, at just after 2 a.m. and, and not go to sleep and not even not go to sleep, but not stop moving like sh there's constant steps what is she doing is she pacing is she cleaning is she what what do you what do you do at, you know 2 30 3 in the morning um you know when i i, I don't i don't know i uh, to me it's not one of those things that makes sense but there are some theories that come out about that later as well so her her watch and this is not in like look i know there's gonna be the people that are like oh well you could be playing the piano and it'll show you take a bunch of steps look did she go home and play the piano for two and a half three hours it, it's possible do i think so no so what was she doing and why was she not asleep it's interesting and then she gets the call you know at um you know almost 
like 4 35 a.m and she's just awake and ready and that's strange to me that's just it's a it's another red flag orange flag yellow flag so they go um and you'll see like i mean see all the deleted calls there she's still like deleting all these things um, so you got the, di how long does it take to digest food and how long does it take to die in the cold? Another thing, um, the body temperature. Um, I don't have, uh, I don't have it in front of me. Some of y'all, there's a couple of y'all in here who know a lot about it. The, do you remember what the body temperature was? Um, they said cold to the touch and the thing, but there was, um, let me see if I can find it. I've got so many documents saved and I'm still trying to get them organized. Um, if he had been out there in this blizzard from 1230, like they're saying. I'm sorry. Sorry, y'all. I'm going on three hours of sleep. <clears throat> Uh, let me see if I can find my medical stuff. I think it was like like 80 ish. Oh. Uh. I'm sorry. Y'all get so mad at me when I yawn, but I'm, if y'all knew how tired I was. Uh, oh, I don't know. It's going to take me forever to dig through stuff. I think it was, I think it was around eighties, somewhere in the eighties, um, his body temperature. Um, so here's why that's so crazy. They're talking about like in the statement, it says, Lady Greg, that's the last yawn, I promise. Last yawn, I promise. Lady and Greg just get to five memberships. Thank you so much, Lady and Greg. I appreciate it. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. I'm so sorry. I try not to yawn. I, I, I know y'all get mad at me when I do, but I'm so tired. Um, all right. So, okay. So, oh, yeah. All right. I see y'all's answers now. Like eight. So, it was like 80. Yeah. Um. So all of the statements are talking about how, you know, like this, like the biggest blizzard that, you know, they've had and all this stuff. And granted at 1230, when this supposedly happened, he had just been, you know, uh, allegedly hit by this car, but that was now it's 6 AM. It's five and a half hours later. And if you're outside in a blizzard, and you're like covered in snow for that long and your body temperature is naturally 98.6 80 degrees or in the 80s as a body temperature is another thing that makes me like does that make sense? Like that doesn't seem like it makes a whole lot of sense to me. So at, at that point, I mean, even if you're inside, um, you know, like, like inside in a cold, you know, environment, that would still be like, oh, okay, well, you know, maybe I could see it, but no, but he's not even just like inside in a cold environment. He's got, you know, supposedly out there since 1230 and has like snow, you know, falling on him and stuff like that's, and to be that, um, to be that temperature, it's just another one of those things that doesn't really make sense. It's another orange flag, red flag. I think that one, I think that one can count as a red flag. All right. Um, let me get out my, all right, so the I'm not gonna get into the other timeline stuff yet because I have there's so much information. Oh my gosh, there's so much information. And I tried to organize it all. I'm not yawning. Um 
But this is Jim McCabe. So again, this is the one who is deleting these things. She's the one who's calling, um, you know, uh, calling John and deleting it. And she's the one who <clears throat> Googled how long to die in the cold and how long to digest food. <clears throat> And I think that the only reason that I could think of that I would be Googling how long to digest food is if I'm trying to find out if there's going to be a big inconsistency with the time of death. So if she didn't really um, hit him and he did go inside the house, like the defense is saying, and there was an altercation with, um, you know, Maybe, I mean, he was in the house and then left at 1.30 to go do administrative work. I, I, I just, it's, the math ain't mathin in my opinion. So it's, it's one of those things that I would need a lot more transparency from the people involved <clears throat> from the officials in order to understand why they're saying these things. And the problem is they are not being transparent. None of their stuff is adding up and it's frustrating to try to sort through all of their stuff because there's so much stuff. And when you have so many conflicting statements and information, it makes it harder like to jump in and, try to sort through and find out what's BS and what's not. Stop whining. She's never done this. Hold on. Let me give her water. You're so bad. I've never seen her whine like this. So crazy. All right. Anyway. All right. So a couple more things. And y'all, I, I am, I am so tired. I, I was able to lay this out a little bit <laughs> easier in the podcast because it was more planned and I was still sleep deprived, but at least I had it organized. But, um, but I wanted to try to put some pictures and faces with names and kind of introduce y'all. So if you haven't listened to it yet, that at least when you listen now, you'll kind of have an idea of what's what and who's who. Um, but a couple more big things that I want to talk about. And then I'm going to and then I'm going to go to bed. <laughs> I know it's only like four or five o'clock, but I'm going to bed. Um, uh, the taillight. Let's talk about the taillight real quick. Um, let's see. Let me find a picture to show you of the tail light. Because oh my god, you're driving me nuts, kid. Um, oh, and there's a hearing Friday, if I didn't say that already. Why am I having so much trouble finding what I'm looking for? <laughs> you hear that? Slow butthead. All right, let's see. Um, why can't I find pictures of it? Oh, here we go.
Let me pull this up. Oh, come on. Come on. Come on. There it is. All right. So, um, Now, let's think about this. If the, if you are running over somebody, the part of your car that sticks out the most would be this part down here. So I would think that there would be more damage done to the car than, than just a taillight. But that's not all. <laughs> they had said that there's a hair you know, a human hair in the taillight and, you know, it's his hair. It wasn't, a, it, it wasn't a hair. So there was the testing. It wasn't a hair. Um, it's, it's, it's one of those things that I have tried to, because I want to try to be as as neutral as possible. So I want to try to like try to really understand completely both sides, and then make a decision on which side I think makes the most sense. So because honestly, like think about it, like the the easiest um, the easiest. solution is generally, um, or like the easiest scenario is generally the, you know, easiest. Okay. But see how far this sticks out. So if there was going to be damage done to the car, I would think that there would have been a lot more of is a lot more issues to the surrounding area this is the taillights out on this, but this is, this is just this. Um, but this, it's just the way that the car is, you would think that there would be some kind of damage and blood and problems down there, right? I mean, wouldn't you think that in order to do the damage that it did. And then when you look at the, you know, the pictures of him from the autopsy, it's his right arm and there's like parallel lacerations. So if you have parallel lacerations, it, that's why, you know, they think that it's, one of the theories is that, you know, there was an altercation inside Chloe, of course, you know, German shepherds are going to protect their owners. So she gets involved, you know, she, um, like, you know, they're saying like, this could be, you know, dog scratches and punctures and stuff. He also has bruising. I mentioned this in the podcast. Um, the podcast is so much more organized than I am right now, honestly, but, um, the, uh, bruising on his hands, um, you know, fractured skull. Okay. If you, and, and, and the, the fractured skull is the back of, okay. If you get hit by a car and you fall where his body was in the grass and the snow, I don't understand how they are explaining the laceration or the, um, you know, fractured skull in the, like in the, back if you fall on 
grass and snow, how does, how, make that make sense. So, I just, I, I, I have so many problems with the way that they've laid this out. And then that's not even, and I'm going to get into that. The tail light's going to be an episode all its own. Stop. Y'all, she has never done this. Why is she freaking out? Um, the tail light's going to be an episode all its own because Canton police were the first on the scene, obviously, because like I said, it's their jurisdiction and then state police took over. Canton police did not find a single piece of taillight. And then state police took over. And then all of a sudden, there's a lot of, there's like 35 pieces of taillight. And then Berkowitz here, I put him on here because I just, like, He's going to be in the next episode, but, and I didn't want to have to redo this for just one episode, but um, I didn't mention him in episode one, but he's, he supposedly, you know, finds taillight pieces after the search, like, and I've, I'm not going to get into too much of it now, but the, the circumstances under which he finds them is 100% red flag. There's just a lot of, things that don't add up and they keep saying the the prosecution side keeps saying there's you know in order for this to be a conspiracy there would have to be 11 people who are you know sticking to this story and so that's why i'm like yeah normally i'd be like there's no way but then you start looking at everything and when nothing is making sense and and then you start filtering in all of these things that are going to be in the coming episodes about other people and their involvement and things that happen in the basement and the, you know, there's so much that is going to be, there's so much involved in this that it started looking like, okay, I'm, you know, I'm going to have to take, you know, take this a little bit, like take this whole conspiracy thing a little bit more seriously. And then I start looking, I'm like, you know, because like I said, I'm not normally a conspiracy theorist type, but there's just so many problems with it. And so I, I am, <laughs> I am exhausted from working on it, but I am excited to kind of go through this with y'all and see where it goes. I will try to do a short stream like this one, just, um, you know, maybe once a week um, to kind of go over what's in the podcast episode. And this has been a crazy week. And like I said, I've been oncologist all morning this morning. So I didn't have time to prep for this one at all. Um, but, um, <laughs> going forward, um, I'm going to, I want to get some stuff prepped and like pictures and stuff like that. So that way we can go over everything that's on the, um, the episode and I'll have it organized so we can take a look at it. There's, there's so much, um, there's so much more to this and it's, and I'm just starting to dig the service. Um, and I know that um, I'd mentioned Turtle Boy in the um, podcast and I see a couple of y'all have mentioned him in here and um, I have talked to him. I, um, and I sent him this, I actually sent him this. I was like, look, you know, double check and I have, make sure I have all these pictures. Right. Cause at this point it was the night I stayed up all night trying to finish the first episode. So I was like, just look at these and make sure I have the right people. Um, so he knows about it. He's, uh, he's, I, th I think I said in the podcast, I think I said he's the loudest voice in the room or something like that. Um, but he has uh, like a ton of articles and videos and stuff like that. Um, hey, I'll call you right back. All right. My brother. Um, so uh, he has a ton of videos and articles and stuff like that. TBDailyNews.com if you want to check out his stuff. Now, I will tell you, um, he does a great job at getting the word out there. Um, he's on YouTube um, and Twitter and um, 
Facebook and everything. He does a great job. He is not his style. I will tell you because I know some of how some of y'all are. His style is not the same as mine. He is a lot more abrasive and which is, you know, it's fine as who he is. It's just I know that some I know how some of our members are and they're not like, you know, that's not their thing. Um, so I just like as far as cuss words go and stuff like that. He's, he's very different. His style is very different than my style, but he knows more about this, um, you know, than, than most people out there. So he's done a lot of reporting on it. And then also Sleuthy Goosey, if you see her, I've been, um, talking to her as well too, cause she's got some, um, uh, great information on this. She's, she works a lot like I do as far as putting together all of the, um, uh, data. She's like me where she likes data um, and facts and reports. So I've talked to her and um, actually I think uh, we're going to try to split some of the <laughs> workload and sort through some of the court documents together and try to find some of the inconsistencies too. So um, he, uh, he is great. If you want to check out some of his stuff, he's got so much information on there. Um, and uh, and, and I don't say that he's abrasive in like a bad way. It's just, it's his style. I just know that some of our, some of our members are like, um, I know when I, when I get mad and cuss on here, sometimes everybody's like, Oh my God, not everybody, but we have those. So I'm just letting you know that his videos are great and informative. They're just, um, he uses stronger language than I do. Just, I'm just <laughs> letting y'all know, but look, he knows, he knows a lot about this and, um, he's done a great job at bringing up a lot of awareness for all of this. And then Sleuthy Goosey, of course she's on, um, um, at Sleuthy Goosey on Twitter or X or whatever we're calling it now. Um, she has a lot of great information too. So I am not the first to the party. I don't want to take credit for any, of the stuff that I didn't do. So I want to bring up those two because they've done, um, they've done, um, a lot of, uh, a lot of looking and in, looking into this stuff. So, um, but I also know that, um, there are people who, uh, Y'all know, you know, like I'm a justice junkie. I want justice for everybody. And I know that there are people who will automatically turn away from people who are more abrasive with their approach. Like, you know, the Wendy's, um, you know, Wendy's approach. Like I said, I kind of mentioned her in the beginning about, you know, like, don't tell other people there's, you know, their ideas are stupid or whatever. Like, so there, and there are some of those on each side where it's, they're very, very passionate in how they feel and their style is more abrasive. I, I'm hoping to bring more awareness to this with a little bit more of a chilled approach because some people, you know, can react to that a little bit better. And the more people that we can, you know, get, all of this out to like the more pressure that it puts on, you know, the Canton police and the DA and, you know, everybody. And hopefully the more we can get, uh, the truth out. So that's what I'm, that's what I'm hoping for. Um, tomorrow, um, I am, I'm about to go to bed now. <laughs> Honestly, I am, I have not slept much lately at all. Um, let's do, let's do 10 o'clock tomorrow. And that gives me a little bit of time, um, to wake up and actually get organized because right now I am so unorganized. Um, so let's, let's get a little bit of a later start tomorrow so that I have time for, um, to actually get some stuff together and get organized so that I'm not sitting here just yawning and trying to find pictures and documents will be more organized tomorrow. But I wanted to, even though I'm not organized today and not, you know, whatever, I still wanted to jump on and just say hi and do a little introduction and show some of the pictures that we have. Um, we'll do uh, uh, 10 o'clock my time. Let's do it. So 11 o'clock Eastern. We'll do 11 o'clock Eastern tomorrow. Does that work for everybody? Well, um, that gives me a little bit of time to get stuff together in the morning. And then, um, um, and then start going over this because there's, there's 
there's so much that we haven't even talked about yet, like stuff with the dog and with the plow driver and with Julie's sister and who's not even on the chart yet. And with Kevin and with Berkowitz. And I mean, y'all, it gets, it gets wild. It gets wild. Um, what's up with the sex therapist trial? I looked for that today because they were supposed to release that today. I don't know if it got delayed again or what, but, um, cause I was planning on streaming that today, but look, maybe that's just the Lord doing for me what I can't do for myself and making me go to sleep. Cause I was planning on streaming that as soon as we finished this, but it's not on there. So I'm assuming they'll have that tomorrow. So, um, so that's the plan. Um, we'll keep we'll keep an update on this. And Friday, there is a hearing on this on Friday. So I'm really excited about that. Um, but there's there's oh my gosh, y'all, this gets this story gets so so wild. Um, so we're gonna keep an eye on it. And the of course as the podcast progresses, and then I'm hoping that our sex therapist trial will be back tomorrow. I'll have to check. I don't know if they got, cause they got delayed for COVID. I have not looked to see if they got delayed again, but I thought they were supposed to be back yesterday, which means we should have had our stream today. So I don't know. Um, uh, tomorrow 10, my time 11 Eastern. Sound good to everybody. I appreciate y'all hanging out. Um, and I will, um, I'll set the stream up to, um, and just keep the chat turned off so mods don't have to worry about trolls and stuff. But I'll, I'll set it up so that we can, um, uh, y'all can set your, set your reminders or notifications or whatever they're called on here. So, all right. If you haven't hit the like button already, please do so. And if you have not listened to the podcast, please listen to it. And the biggest thing you can do to help is if you will give us a rating on the, um, like a rating or review on the podcast that helps so much and it helps us, um, grow and it makes all of the sleep deprivation worth it. So, um, I appreciate it. Thank you for reporting to jury duty and I will see y'all.